salvation costs. Well, those were the words of a young man leaving the safety of his camp to try and protect his friends from great danger in the Amazon Prime drama, The 100. Young people had been sent back to Earth from a space station where they'd gone because the world had been destroyed by a nuclear war. But the oxygen was running out on the space station. So they sent a hundred young people down to the earth to see if they could inhabit it. Only when they got there, they discovered that there were people living there and they called these people the grounders and they ended up in, a, in conflict with them. And they're encamped in there, in their camp with the grounders coming all around and their future looked in desperate peril. So one young man grabbed his gun and prepared to jump into the fray. And his friend tried to pull him back. It's too risky, he shouted. Salvation costs, said the young man, as he broke free and ran at the grounders. Now I haven't seen far enough in the series to know if his actions made a difference. I need to watch the next episode. But the horror on the faces of his friends at his seemingly rash act Stuck with me. Why would you do something to endanger your own life, especially against overwhelming odds? And it's that sort of dilemma that we're facing in our final chapter of Ruth. Now the situation isn't as stark, there's no risk to life and limb, but there is a risk to a way of life. There is a risk to a level of financial security. So let's remember where we're up to in the story. Naomi has returned to Bethlehem penniless and destitute after her years in Moab. She had left with an empty tummy, but a full life with a husband and two lads. But she's returned empty with none of them because they died in Moab. Only a Moabite daughter-in-law who refused to leave her. But God had his hand on them both. When Ruth went out to glean the leftovers of the harvest, the only way to get food to eat and an income, she chose the field of Boaz, a good and a godly man. He looked after Ruth and even gave her extra grain to take home to Naomi. And then we discovered that he was their guardian redeemer, a close family member, who in Old Testament times had the responsibility of looking after them and of preserving their family name. And as soon as Boaz learned that he was this important <coughs> man to Ruth and Naomi, then he set about doing the right thing. And chapter three last week ended with Naomi telling Ruth, the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. An urgency about it. It will be settled today. But there was a fly in the ointment. In all the best stories, there's a fly in the ointment, isn't there? Boaz wasn't the only guardian redeemer. There was another man whose connection was even closer. He needed to be approached first. And that's where we find Boaz at the start of chapter 4. He's taken himself straight off to the town gate, the place where decisions are made and deals are brokered. And he sits down. He always sat down in those days to make a deal. And as he sits down, just then, the other guardian, Redeemer, appears. Just then. Well, what are the chances of that? Pretty high when God's involved. And that's what's happening here. Just as when Ruth went out to find a field and just happened to choose Boaz's field. The very man they need is suddenly right there, right time, right place. And Boaz beckons him over and then gathers 10 of the town elders to join them. This is going to be serious business. Boaz lays out the situation to the other guardian redeemer. Verse 3. 
Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belongs to our relative Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me, so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you. And I am next in line. So Naomi, it seems, still has this piece of land that belongs to Elimelech. But she's been gone for so long, either it's been left to go to wreck and ruin, nothing to harvest from it that season, or maybe even somebody else has commandeered it and is using it. Whatever the reason is, she can't liquidise that asset. She can't use it. There's nothing coming from it. And her needs are immediate, so she must sell it. And in order to keep the land in the family, and that's really important as we read through these early parts of the Old Testament, that land that God had given them is so important to keep within those tribes, those clans, those families. And so it's right for the nearest relative to have the first dibs at buying it. And it is a pretty decent proposal. He doesn't need to go and check with his accountant or his financial advisor if it's a good idea. He says straight away, I'll redeem it. It is an excellent deal. But there's a catch, verse 5. On the day you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with the property. Ah, not quite so simple then. If he plans to take up this role of guardian redeemer and have the privilege of buying that land, there are other consequences that come along with it. Naomi and Ruth are also his responsibility. As the nearest relative, he must also marry Ruth and produce an heir for Marlon and therefore Elimelech, so that their family line isn't lost. And that's not such an attractive proposal. Rather than making him money, this would cost him. He'd have to support two widows and then possibly raise a child that would have another man's name. And that child would then inherit the land in the end anyway. So even though it's his responsibility, he's not interested. Verse 6. Then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. But it's costly. Saving Ruth and Naomi and keeping <laughs> Elimelech's family name alive costs. Salvation costs. And this guardian redeemer isn't willing to pay that price. But Boaz is. He is a good man and a godly one. He will pay the price and do the right thing. What a contrast. And you see, just because somebody had the role of guardian redeemer didn't mean they necessarily lived up to it. You might remember the account of Onan in Genesis chapter 38, who took on his late brother's wife, Tamar, in this same way, this leveret marriage agreement. But then he cheated by preventing her from getting pregnant. Happy to sleep with her, but he didn't want to produce a child with her. And people don't always do the right thing, especially if doing the right thing costs. But Boaz chooses to do it. And in making that costly choice, he will save Ruth and Naomi, but he will also save the nation and ultimately we will be saved as well let's see how <clears throat> well the deal is made the other guardian redeemer hands over his sandal to boaz transferring the right to buy to him and boaz publicly declares before everyone what he has done verse 9 today remember today naomi was mentioning it today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi 
all the property of Elimelech, Kilion and Marlon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, Marlon's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from his hometown. Today, you are witnesses. Today. Well, Naomi wasn't wrong when she said to Ruth, the man will not rest until this matter is settled today. Well, today it is settled and witnessed by the elders and everyone gathered at the gate. And it's celebrated. Verse 11. We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the family of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. What a wonderful blessing. The witnesses ask God to make this Moabite woman, a foreigner and more than that, from enemies of God's people, to make her like Rachel and Leah who, with their servant girls, were the mothers of the twelve tribes of Israel, the foundation of their nation. They asked God to make Boaz have even greater standing and to build a family of note, just as God had already done in Boaz's ancestry, when Perez finally became the father of Tamar's child, taking on that responsibility of continuing the family line albeit a little unwittingly. You'll need to read back in Genesis if you can't remember the story of that. But those blessings those people make will come true. Boaz's costly act does save Ruth and Naomi. They have a home and the Lord enables Ruth and Boaz to have a child who will be their guardian redeemer in his turn, who will look after them. And that child, he's a mini miracle in and of himself. Boaz is old. Ruth had been married before and hadn't been able to conceive. But God is there in this situation and he gives her the gift of a son, Obed. But this child won't just keep Elimelech's line going and look after his mother and grandmother. He will be a link in the chain to save the nation. The last verses of the book contain a genealogy from Perez to Boaz and then on to the next two generations. Boaz, the father of Obed, Obed, the father of Jesse and Jesse, the father of David. King David. The shepherd boy who became king, the king with a big heart for God. The one the book of Judges looks forward to when it finishes with the words, In those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. Well, David was the king who would come and bring the golden age in Israel. And he wouldn't have existed if Boaz hadn't done the right thing by Ruth. And of course, there's another in the line of David who would save not just a nation, but the world, Jesus. Boaz's faithfulness led ultimately to the birth of the Messiah. Now, isn't that amazing? And of course, Boaz points us to Jesus as well. He made such a costly sacrifice to save Ruth and Naomi. But Jesus took on the ultimate sacrifice to save us and everyone who puts their trust in him. Salvation was truly costly for him, so it could be freely available to us. And so what a wonderful true story and one which models faithful living to us. Naomi, who in her grief and poverty, and though she was angry with God, never gave up on him and came back. Ruth, 
who chose to turn her back on the Moabite gods of her youth and follow Yahweh, becoming a true daughter of Naomi and of Abraham too. Boaz, who lived faithfully in the midst of the moral chaos of his time, doing the right thing, whatever the cost. And the God who looks after his faithful people and who is pleased to include them in his plans. So may God help us to live faithfully as his people in our time and be a part of his plans for the world that we live in today, pointing others to Jesus and the wonderful salvation found only in him. Well, let's pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much <clears throat> that Jesus chose to make that costly choice to bring about our salvation, to go to the cross, to die in our place. We thank you for his life, his death and his resurrection. And we thank you for Boaz, who points us to Jesus. We thank you for his faithful life in a time of moral chaos his choices, which led to salvation for others. We thank you for Ruth, who chose to leave everything to follow you and to stay faithful to Naomi. We thank you that in your grace you brought her into your family too. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for Naomi as well, facing such terrible grief and loss yet never quite giving up on you. And so we pray that you would help us to, to hold this true story close to our hearts and to model our life of faith on those we've learnt about. We ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Amen.